hit him with the bell. Sitting by the pool, meditating in Chanel. Mama. Sustainability and love? Why does it matter? Let's find out. <laughs> Welcome to my channel. Um, my name is Sammy Bada and I'm a PhD student at the University of Cambridge in the Department of Chemistry. Yeah, it's actually a really gloomy day today, but it's a Saturday and I am heading to the lab. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of a day in the life, but not really. Um, it's kind of be it's going to be a bit special because um, I'm actually going to be. Let's just wait for the car to go so you can hear me properly um, today's all about pretty much talking about sustainability in the lab I think it's such an important topic and I'm gonna have a special guest um, Adriana um, who works in the CMD as well so when you wake up in the morning don't look around to find me as you can see the lab is empty well there's one person there but yeah Saturday feels, but I'm in the lab, but not for too long, hopefully. <laughs> there is Adriana, um, so this is Adriana, and she is, oh, actually, just introduce yourself. Um, yes, hello, my name is Adriana, and I'm also working in the CMD in Cambridge, and yeah, I have a podcast about sustainability, and I hope we can talk about this today a bit more. Yes, actually the podcast was released today, so congratulations on that. Um, what is it actually, just even just quickly talk about the podcast, yeah. what's the title? So it's called The Caring Scientist, yeah. Mission Sustainable, and it's on, available on all the platforms on Spotify, Anchor, wherever. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to put the link down below in the description so you guys can have access to that. Um, but yeah, let's go into the lab, because um, like I said, I do have quite a bit of experiments to do um, today and I'm basically going to be working on basically chemical mutagenesis, it's called chemical mutagenesis, um, basically um, using the modified alpha cyanucleate and then further modifying it using some chemicals um, that I'm not going to go into but yeah you just see but like I said the most important part of today's day in the life is all about sustainability can't even speak. <laughs> Sustainability within the lab. Okay, let's go. Yeah, um, so just briefly, just like, what what do you think sustainability in the lab kind of means? Yeah. So I think it's a bit difficult to answer that question because we kind of think about sustainability more in our private life. And me personally, I'm trying to be as sustainable as possible, you know, trying to reduce plastic waste, e eating healthy locally and you know maybe even vegan or vegetarian so all these things but then when I come into the lab it's sometimes really hard to be sustainable mm -hmm. um, but labs are consuming so much energy water and then we talk about the most visible thing is actually plastic waste yeah and I mean, it's just crazy. Have you ever? What do you think? I mean, how much, I, mean, how much I mean, we have so much. Like, uh, uh, you know, even right now, I'm going to be using a lot of this um, Epin dolls. They're all plastic. We have so many tips here. You know, tip boxes around. Like, they're all kind of plastic, and they just pretty much going to the waste. Like, at the moment, my waste is empty. <laughs> but let's just see yeah, by the see. end of exactly. by the end of this, like <laughs> how much waste I'm gonna have in terms of tips and yeah. stuff like that. But like what you said is is pretty much is on point because it's funny because like most of the time I think, oh, I'm actually pretty sustainable because I'm like I do recycle, I do try and eat kind of like a healthy, sustainable diet because I'm like mostly a vegetarian. But then I forget actually within my workplace I'm kind of detaching it a bit and not even thinking about wait am I actually being sustainable all around because the amount of plastic like until I spoke to you I actually realised that wait a minute I literally just use so much plastic yeah. and don't even think about it that I'm actually just you know wasting this in a way but I'm thinking oh yeah it's all for the good of science but actually yeah. We can try and be sustainable in some exactly. sort of ways. Exactly. It's just that we're not putting effort in. Exactly. Um, we, we are doing 
uh, you know, we are trying to improve things with, with science, uh, but we can do so many things as well in the lab yeah. and actually have a better environment in science. And I think that's what motivates me. I mean, I'm not saying like bad plastic or yeah. anything like that. Um, just, you know, I think we have to be more mindful because all the plastic we're using is single use. Yeah. But in theory, for a lot of things, you can reuse it. Separately. Yeah, I, I, I do feel like sometimes the kind of ignorance of how we use plastic comes with money in some senses because like some labs who have a lot of money you're able to buy just the boxes like the whole kind of boxes of epping dolls whereas some other labs most labs they reuse the box and they just put the kind of the tips yeah. into it and I, we can literally even i could even show you because like in our cabinet we have the various types we have the boxes that are already available and then we have the tips yeah. already so by not buying the box with the tips you're already reducing you know that amount of plastic that you're using exactly. in some sort of way so like even little things like that because in my old lab we used to just refill it yeah. and then autoclave it yeah. and that was fine and we were like oh it's sterile and yeah. we're working with bacteria and loads of stuff but i feel like sometimes it's just you yeah. just get lazy <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I mean, because it takes time, right? It yeah. takes time if you, you know, have to refill everything. But I think, you know, what's currently happening um, in a lot of science or research labs all around the world, we are experiencing shortages. Mm -hmm. So we just don't get enough tips because of all the COVID testing. Yeah. And um, yeah, so we actually have to do it now. Yeah. I think that's why people are becoming more aware. Okay, actually... <laughs> This is how it used to, to be, be. Yeah. or you know, in this lab, <laughs> yeah, we used to just purchase the whole box. But um, I think one of the good things is that these boxes can be recycled, so yeah. they are take back programs yeah. that yeah. people can look into. And also for gloves, if they are not contaminated oh. for biohazardous. Um, I actually didn't know about that. Yeah. Exactly. I, mean, I just naturally, I mean, a lot of the times we just use our gloves and just throw it away yeah. in a bin. No, but there are take back programs. Oh, for gloves, uh, okay. But only if they're not contaminated with bio. With bio. Okay, okay. That's good um, to know. I didn't know that. Maybe that's something that yeah. we need to try and implement as well um, yeah, in some definitely. sort of ways. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, that's such an important point. Um, so, can I ask you a question? Yeah. So, how about. Maybe listen to, to my podcast already. Okay. How much plastic waste do you think academic labs generate each year? Each year. So just a rough estimate. What Ooh. do you think? I feel like it's on a million scale or billion. Yes, yes it's definitely a million. Okay. So there's this one study from 2015, which is already quite super old, but there are no New York studies, but they say 5.5 million tons. 5.5 guys 5.5 million yeah. tons so that's the, insane yeah if you think about it that's like 67 cruise ship liners oh my goodness right the combined weight of those or and i i like the statistic more it's the double amount of waste that coca-cola produces because you can buy coca-cola everywhere <laughs> wow <laughs> that's all bad. the parts of the world and imagine the double amount of waste wow that's, that's insane yeah that's bad yeah. that's when you know how bad it is and it's only academic labs huh? i'm excluding industry. industry and hospitals wow so guys there's a lot of waste yeah. coming from here yeah um <laughs> that's not good that's not that's not what we like to hear um but yeah i think like i said previously a lot of like academic labs we were like we all kind of say oh yeah we're kind of paying our own back in the way that oh we're improving understanding to health and stuff but actually that's not the way we should be looking at it at the end of the day we're still um harming our environment in some ways um and we need to try and improve or actually implement things that look like we're actually trying to improve on and like um what you were talking, touching upon um which was like during covid times we're having shortages of like tips and stuff like that and that made me realize oh wait we haven't got a new tip box so i need to actually refill my tip box yeah. you know and those are things that well, we you could be might, doing yeah and you might not have even enough tips so yeah. you have to work yeah. with less, <laughs> with with less to, right? yeah. yeah and actually have to actually think about how to, um think about it i mean it's going to be hard initially but once you get used to doing that then it becomes a habit. Okay, this is um, Ava, 
um, a lab technician. Um, too hard working, she makes my protein, she makes everything. Very comforting, very supportive, everything. And she's working in the weekend, like, come on. It's Saturday. It's Saturday. Guys. Like, this is our choice. Our choice. But Ava's here to make us some more protein on the weekend. Can we just clap? Uh, no, no, yeah, but still, you're thinking about us. You're thinking about, yeah, you're thinking about our proteins. Thank you, Ava. <laughs> Thanks. See you later, Ava. Yeah, actually, let's actually we can walk around the lab a little bit. Um, so we do have like recycling bins, and you can see it around here. Um, I mean, also, oh yeah, so this is a recycling station for like a lot of the tip boxes. Exactly, yeah. It's yeah. uh, taken back and yeah. um, I think they might be reused until you cannot use them anymore and then they get recycled. Yeah, yeah, but like we were saying that actually the best thing to do in the first place is actually not to have exactly. this this kind of system exactly. in a way. So if we go to like the cabinet here, um, we have so many of these that are available there, there that you can refill your tip boxes. So what we should try and do is do less of that, buying that and more of that. Exactly. Especially knowing that we're not really, in our lab, we're not exactly, uh, uh, we don't work with a lot of like bacteria and stuff that need to be sterile in some ways. So we can try our best to kind of use less, buy less of this because that's more plastic and have more of that so we can just refill a lot of the boxes but those are like pretty much simple ways in terms of like starting off that we can do to just improve you know sustainability in the lab um yeah, yeah. i mean and it has a big impact if you I, uh, actually there on twitter there was this uh social media campaign where you had to uh, weigh the plastic waste that you generate as a scientist uh, on your daily basis mm -hmm. and if you think about it it's just crazy it depends obviously if you're working in what field you're working but people are generating really yeah kilograms per per day which is just shocking right yeah hi michael <laughs> so yeah i mean yeah as we just pointed out definitely mm -hmm. that tip box yeah. Taking part in take back programs. That's yeah. Cool. Also for gloves. Uh, gloves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in general, also what we can do is order in bulk. Mm -hmm. So not having too many parcels with a lot of packaging material. Mm. Yeah. Alright, we're going upstairs no. to pick up some samples. Nice. There we go. Yeah, so I mean, apart from like plastic. What other like the other kind of like ways that we can reduce, you know, our, our energy consumption. Exactly. You know, for example, the minus eighty freezer. Yes. Um. Really, it doesn't need to be a minus eighty. Um, yes. You know, <laughs> people don't know really why it's minus eight. It used to be minus seventy, but yeah. then newer models came on the market and they could do minus eighty. Yeah. So people got used to doing minus eighty. So, and um, actually, did you know that you can save up to 30% of the energy of minus 80 freezer uses by switching it to minus 70? Wait, so 30% yeah. of energy consumption? Yeah. That is a lot. Um, yeah, that's quite interesting because like we're saying in terms of the minus 80 freezer, I never thought actually defrosting it was something that was important. Defrosting it was just something that, for me, that I just thought it was really annoying when I see like a lot of ice just piling up and on the door and it's just making it so difficult to like close and open. Yeah. Um, but the I, I thought it was really bad, but I didn't think that had an impact on energy consumption. Yes, definitely, because the ice build up basically inhibits that the freezer can stay cool everywhere. So, yeah. um, yeah, it's just so important to remove the ice there regularly because there is ice buildup, right? Yeah, it's it's yeah. very common. But now we've got your samples. So yes, I've got my, got my alpha sign sample that was, um, well, first of all, I actually purified this, not Ava. <laughs> <laughs> I purified this myself, um, but this is the mutant I'm basically trying to modify, essentially. Um, it's very easy. I'm basically going to be making a chemical and I'm going to be adding it to it and then leaving it to shake overnight for 
the weekend till Monday. Okay. And that's pretty much it. It's very straightforward. Cool. <laughs> what do you think, how much like one auto plate like how much water is used? I don't know, I've never really filled up yeah. an autoclave. Yeah. I've used a small one and yeah. I know that it just reduces very drastically. Yeah. The little small ones that you can yeah. put like one bottle in. Yeah. Um, and that uses like, I don't know how much you put in there, maybe like, do we put like 500 mils mm -hmm. in those ones and then it just... Okay, those goes, are the small ones, the but small the ones. steam jacket ones yeah. use uh, between 270 to 400 meters per cycle. Woo! So much. <laughs> That's really bad um, that's a lot yeah just filling that up constantly yeah i mean but there are water saving devices that you can attach as well yeah um, or just getting a better newer model because the old ones are the most water consuming wow well, okay i mean there's so much that is a bit difficult like even when you think about in the lab right now we have like a lot of the lights are on bridges are on like everything is still yeah. kind of working constantly 24 hours in a day it's so difficult but i think it's like you said it's so important to try our best to reduce it as much as we can but like, right now I'm just that's not been charging so yeah. <laughs> switch that off <laughs> um, because that's power being generated and it's not being used at all yeah yeah if um, we would become better at turning things off and you know, being a bit more mindful about everything that exactly. we do in the I think we can definitely have a positive impact. Yeah, I guess so, because that's the thing, like, when you're at home, you easily think about those things, but then when you come to a different environment, you kind of detach ourselves and yeah. just think about your experiments constantly. I mean, it's very difficult because, like, you want, on one hand, think about your experiment, but on another hand, you know, not really thinking about all oh, the impact that this is yeah. having on the environment and I think and that Yeah, and the difference is you don't have to pay the electricity yeah. <laughs> you That is true. That oh is God. true. If yeah, yeah, probably if we did then I mean I don't think like our PhD salary would be sufficient. Oh <laughs> not at all. Like I don't get paid enough at all. <laughs> at all. Not even close to being paid enough. So yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just adding my protein, aliquotting my protein into a different tube. All my stuff failed, so I don't have to work today. Oh no! <laughs> Michael! It all aggregated in my diet. Oh. There's like flakes of it, and I was like, should I put this on the column? Oh. I'm so sorry. Because like, I don't have to work today, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to try and have a nice yeah. weekend. <laughs> see you, Michael. Oh, see, that's the sad part of you know, doing a PhD or working in science. Things never work out the way you want it to work out. <laughs> Even this right now, it might not work and I'm just going with it. You know, <laughs> you probably have to try about 50 times before one thing actually works, you know. And exactly like for Michael, he's coming during the weekend thinking, oh, I hope this works and dedicated some time to come in and it's not worked out the way he wants it to and that's pretty much the life of a scientist at the moment <laughs> so yeah that's the thing about like doing a phd i think it can be very stressful it can be very yeah just um it, it consumes so much energy right mm -hmm. and it, one usually takes it quite personally if something doesn't work but, yeah i mean it doesn't mean that you're a bad scientist just like that <laughs> you know we are working on very tricky things. We are working on new regenerative diseases. There yeah. are no cures out there right now. So yeah. it's easy to get frustrated. But I think that's why we should always re remind ourselves to have a positive attitude. And if something doesn't work, maybe find another solution. Yeah. And I think also actually science is all about also creativity. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's something we briefly talked about um, when we met before. Um, <laughs> Yeah, like having being creative and also doing science, it comes hand in hand mm -hmm. in a in a way um, now, especially like in the era of science communications. You know, being able to communicate science in a way that everyone can understand is so important mm -hmm. nowadays, especially with coronavirus. As you can mm -hmm. see, misinformation is just is very detrimental mm -hmm. to people's understanding of you know science in general and trust as well. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> We have like such a huge duty yeah. um, 
you know, as scientists to communicate it in the right way. Yeah, exactly. So I'm following Sam. Okay. Yes. You cannot see his head, but he's uh, vortexing. Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you're mixing now your protein. Have you um, so this is not my protein. No? So this is the reagent I'm going to be using for the mutagenesis mm -hmm. of the protein. I'm just vortexing it um, in my buffer. Um, just mixing it well um, because it's quite it's quite um, viscous so I need to ensure that it's properly suspended um, as much as possible yeah. so yeah I think it looks fine to me all right so now I'm gonna add it to my protein there we go <laughs> so far this is my waist mm -hmm. which is not too bad but I mean this is not a typical day so I can't this is not really a true representation, I would say. <laughs> um, but it could be worse today, so we'll take it. We're happy with it. Um, I'll put this back here. And then literally I am going to put this all in a shaker. But first of all, I need to label all of them. Put all that back. I'm pretty much done with my experiments today. But we're going to carry on talking about sustainability in a lab and just show you some several things I think Adriana has quite a bit of stuff to show us as well yeah. <laughs> so what do we have here Adriana all right so um, here you can see a lot of different tubes that we're using right so the smallest one is 0 0.5 milliliter and the biggest one is 50 milliliter and I just wanted to point out to all the scientists out there and it's so important to choose the right size for the right volume because often we're kind of in a rush, right? And then we just have like a five milliliter volume and we just put it in here, right? Um, but why don't you take the five milliliter tube instead? Because that would be much more, uh, much less waste, right? So this is just an example that I want to make. You can reduce your plastic impact by choosing the right um, item. And this is another example. So this is uh, a reservoir that you can use, for example, for ELISA plates. So you use a multi-channel uh, pipette and fill it up with buffer or your protein. And I've seen a lot of times people just throw this away. So this block of, of plastic, right? Yeah. Um, however, if you have to throw away this, why don't you get a solution like this so this is like a plastic can you show us that again I like i really like that yeah so so basically look this at that. is like a stand wow and this is what you put in right and this you throw out and it this is much less waste than this yes however i think also if you want to reuse that so if you have buffer you can just simply wash this so right yeah yeah so this is also fine but there are some creative solutions out there right yeah um so. Definitely, I like that. I mean, I've actually never used this before. Yeah. Is this a, that's a five mil. I like exactly. that. Yeah, because we also didn't have it until recently. Really? Yeah, because it was always such a jump from two milliliters. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. That's something that is definitely useful because I, I think I've always had like some things that are like certain sizes. Either I have to use more, separate it in those, or I have to use a big one. Yeah. Um, and this fits in the um, centrifuge yeah. easily. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. I love it. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. So often we use ultra pure water in experiments, right? Um, so this is an example of a machine where it gives us purified waters that we use for buffers and so on because it doesn't contain uh, bacteria and the toxins and it's ultra pure water, right? Um, however, a lot of these devices need a lot of water to generate ultra pure water. So, look at that, it's already coming through. Yeah, <laughs> if you take out two liters, it depends from model to model, but they use up to eight liters just to generate two liters of. Um, That's insane. So, this is an example of invisible water usage. We, we actually, I, I was shocked when I found out. I, mean, I was <laughs> definitely not aware of that at all. Yeah. That is new to me. So, <laughs> only take it if you really need it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I think I think there's something like quite general in a lot of chemistry labs. I mean, my lab, our lab is not really that chemistry based. It's very interdisciplinary, but I can say definitely in most chemistry labs you have a lot of fume hoods. Um 
that are constantly working this is off and i don't even think this works at all we have other few hoods downstairs that actually um that actually work but this is kind of an example of like something that uses a lot of energy right you would say i think fume hoods use quite a lot of energy and i think a lot of people within chemistry labs do not close the sash and i think that's very important and i even think here it says close um so closing the sash actually reduces kind of the um the energy. energy consumption yeah. um generally because it either slows things down within it because it's always on yeah. but it just slows down and knows that okay now we can yeah. work out at such a lower pace we don't have to be working at a full pace whereas yeah. when it's open it just keeps working I definitely feel that are one of the items that use the most energy in labs they estimates say it uses the same energy as 3.5 households per day wow that's so insane it's super important to close it every time you use it and switch it off uh, when you don't need it anymore because yeah i mean it uses more energy than minus 80 freezers yeah i intuitively would have thought it's a minus 80 freezer yeah it's actually a few months so. yeah but yeah we have like so many like equipment that like we we're saying that are usually just on that probably don't need to be on at least this is off i think um mm -hmm. yeah but there's so many that people are not using at the moment that i think especially during the weekend we should try and turn it off um because it's not being in use i'm not sure if this is in use mm -hmm. at the moment yeah exactly because i think what happens in yeah. most academic labs is that we all have very irregular working patterns so some people tend to work long hours come late or leave early uh, so things tend to be on 24 7 yeah uh, but maybe like this can be improved by having some sort of stickers that remind people okay turn this off or oh, the geez. last person or just communicate a bit better actually does anyone need this yeah or even straight after you finish using it yeah. just turn it off um it's not really hard to turn it back on really when you need it so when you finish using it just turn it off especially things like this that are very simple that doesn't have any impact on you know people's experiments i guess that there are other things that may have an impact that you don't want to turn off like i would say the actors are very complicated yeah. um you don't want to turn it off um sometimes yeah. it's a bit problematic with heat blocks right yeah some people like to have it on as soon as they reach the lab yeah uh, and sometimes it's also i don't know if you ever had this situation that you wanted to run an experiment desperately and needed yeah but then it was turned off and then it took a while for it to get back i mean most of our heat uh, we turn tend to turn it off really yeah, that's really and good. then it we turn it on when we need it to be on i think because yeah. we don't use it that much so yeah, yeah so um you know another solution if people like to use uh heat blocks uh and have it turned on let's say when they reach the lab at i don't know 10 a.m there are outlet timers that you can get so automatically it switches on and then it switches off at night oh wow um, so that's another solution that you can do interesting yeah. it's good to know good to know yeah yeah several so now we're in the autoclave room yeah this is a huge autoclave look at that and then that's a tiny little one right there <laughs> and exactly we use autoclaves to sterilize uh, mm -hmm. you know utensils but they are so energy and water consuming so it's always important to fill it up completely and not just randomly start it for like one little thing because well it depends on model to model and how new they are mm -hmm. and how old they are <laughs> but um i've heard like that it takes up to 270 liters per cycle of water. insane so uh, yeah yeah I can clearly see that this is something that they're probably doing here especially with the rubbish you can see that it's not like oh there's a there's a pile of them so it means that they're probably trying to make sure we have a lot before putting it in um so yeah um yeah that I think that's clearly and I think it seems the major problem we're having the autoclave is do not overfill so it looks like people are actually trying to put yeah. as much which is a good thing um Definitely. yeah <laughs> um, if the major problem is don't overfill it that's a good thing um exactly. not underfilling it yeah. um so yeah that's good yes that was the okay yeah. yeah i think that's is that pretty much it right i think that's pretty much it um what we can do oh, should i 
Yeah. yeah. Okay, no, there we go. I say something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, that's... I, mean, I just wanted to say there are a lot of things that we can do and I, I feel like it's also our responsibility and I, I think a lot of young people, including us, we are very passionate about our planet so we can contribute that by, you know, doing a few things that might yeah, be not look so big to you but it has a big impact uh, because labs are just using a lot of resources, waste, and water. So um, yeah, thank you for watching guys and yeah. uh, please listen to the podcast. Yes, and, yes, uh, I will definitely put the link down <laughs> below. Um, yeah, thank you so much for joining me Adriana and I think um, it's fair. We're definitely going to be, you're going to be on this channel again. Yay. We need to, we need to talk through, um, I mean, your journey, um, through like masters, PhD. I mean, she has completed her PhD. Um, this is a process I'm going through right now. And I feel like I have a lot to learn and it'll be great to obviously have a conversation with you about that. Um, so, so yeah, definitely. Um, this is going to be good. But guys, I hope you've enjoyed, um, this video about sustainability in the lab. And I hope a lot of you can take some tips. Um, in terms of how to become more sustainable, in terms of reducing the energy, uh, plastic consumption, and so on and so forth. Maybe even talking to your labs about it, and just maybe even just creating awareness about it, because I think that's very important. Um, but I, get, I hope you guys have enjoyed this, and if you have, please subscribe to my channel, please put the thumbs up, please just write any thin, any comments you have in the comments below, and I hope to see you guys in the next video. So um, stay blessed, dream big, and keep being inspired. Goodbye. <laughs> Go. Take two. <laughs>